Hello, and welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Poorman. At the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees meeting on April 17th, Director Greer Carson mentioned a change in periodical deliveries. For years, we received the Herald Times, Indy Star, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today from direct carriers, which ensured that we'd have each day's issue available the same morning or the afternoon at the latest. We were informed in March alongside a pair of Herald Times articles on the 13th and 15th that carrier delivery will discontinue and that all print paper distribution will now go through the U.S. Postal Service. While it's understandable from a business model standpoint, it does mean we're unlikely to receive print newspapers early enough each day to have them available to the public upon opening and that we can't really guarantee same day availability of some print newspapers. Carson said patrons can instead refer to the library's online editions of the newspapers, which are typically immediately available. Additionally, the library started a Blu-ray video collection. The first few weeks have already shown some strong circulation. And so we'll see how this collection grows. They are located at the end of the adult DVD collection on the second floor. The next Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees meeting will be held on May 15th at 5.45 p.m. During public comment at the Bloomington City Council meeting on April 17th, several Bloomington business owners spoke to the council about the convention center and encouraged them to proceed with its construction. Director of Operations at Chocolate Moose, Jordan Davis, said the tax money should be used for the purpose it was set aside to fund. I honestly find it very disheartening that I feel like I had to be here today, uh, but I feel like it's necessary to show my support for a project that's already had so many setbacks and I was beginning to come hopeful uh, that it had a fairly clear path ahead. Uh, I think it's very important for our community to trust our local government, and I can think of very few things that would undermine your constituents' trust in you more than using the money that has been collected solely for one purpose for anything other than its intended use, expanding the convention center. Uh, please allow the CIB to complete the tasks they've been set out to do in a timely manner. As I'm sure you're well aware, every month that we're waiting is costing $160,000. Uh, we don't have time to waste. Uh, we're the second most desirable convention market in the state. The demand is there. It's a supplier's market right now for conventions, and we're primed to capitalize on it. My company and many others in town have happily gone along with the food and beverage tax, knowing that it would lead to a brighter future for the city that we love so much. Uh, please don't turn your back on us. Uh, we just want to see it, see it happen. Owner of the Orbit Room, Mike Klingy, suggested ways that the convention center could be beneficial, like consolidating the convention center and the visitor's center. Orbit Room opened in 2018, so we've never known life without a food or beverage tax, but honestly, the 1% doesn't seem like a lot when we knew that it was going to expand a convention center to also help drive business to the downtown area, which could be very needed, especially on Sundays through Thursdays. Um, I don't know if everyone that is watching the Zoom or it follows this as, as intently, but um, the convention center can't even currently really do a, a convention of even 500 people over a weekend. It's not like we need to have a 5,000 person convention center or anything like that. Just an updated one that's not from like the 1980s that we can do different things than just the traditional things that a convention center does. I also think sometimes the point that is missed too because I believe some of the plans was to maybe relocate the visitor center with the convention center in a centrally located downtown area which would also kind of make the downtown area make a little more sense with if you have the visitor center here, you have the convention center, this is all this area downtown, which also might help cull the traffic a little bit of speeding because there would be more activity in that area and perhaps we could get it a little more pedestrian friendly there as well. Um, there's a great uh, visitor center in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, at least once a week, they do a live concert from their visitor center that is uh, broadcast onto the community radio station. The entire place fills up with community members watching these amazing touring bands playing. Um, there's just one kind of idea of what could happen in a visitor center that's also in the convention center. Um, everyone else has made so many great points about it, I don't wanna go on too long other than that. I'm so happy to hear this is happening and moving forward, but it also, it's been six years and you've collected a lot of money for this one purpose. And so let's, let's 
Let's work together and get it done. The first item on the agenda for the council to consider was the resolution opposing the LEAP Pipeline Water Diversion Project, which the council had previously passed on March 27th with a vote of 5-0-4. to zero to four. Following the vote, Mayor Carrie Thompson did not sign the resolution, thus vetoing it on April 11th. If the council majority voted to support the resolution again, it would be officially passed without the signature of the mayor. Councilmember Andy Ruff shared a summary of the resolution and addressed council members' concerns about upsetting the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. The first thing I want to do is remind us what it's not about. It is not a resolution against the IEDC. Uh, it's about our concern over a potent, potentially precedent-setting, risky, and environmentally harmful proposal to divert a huge amount of water from the groundwater supply for communities across a wide swath of the state that uh, is precedent-setting in a way that uh, could certainly and will likely affect Bloomington directly in the near future, given our dependence on Lake Monroe and its uh, potential uh, to be tapped in a similar way. Um, and, you know, part of resolution, resolutions like this in Bloomington uh, are the official uh, sanctioned way and strongest tool we have as a council to make a collective statement about an important issue. Um, back to the IEDC issue, communities up and down the Wabash have passed resolutions very much like this one. And they are all, most of those communities are actively engaged with the IEDC through large grants, ready grants, other economic development proposal uh, programs, and things are fine. Um, the arguments have been made in the past meetings. Uh, you've, we've heard from Kevin o uh, Kerwin Olson of the Citizens Action Coalition. Um, you know that cities up and down, cities and counties up and down uh, that swath of the state have, have passed them. Um, I want to add that I've also spoken to our council rep I mean our state representative Matt Pierce for Bloomington who uh, is in full agreement that this is a, an issue that directly impacts and affects Bloomington. It's a very important issue that we should be concerned about. Council member Dave Rollo explained why the Bloomington City Council should pass the resolution even though it is not a project directly impacting the city. So much is asked about why why is this a concern to Bloomington? Number 1 Indiana taxpayers are footing the bill for this. Number two, according to the Citizen Action Coalition, which is the preeminent public interest advocacy group in the state, whose director and, and, and researcher, Kerwin Olson and Grant Smith, respectively, were here last time, the CAC explains in the report that ratepayers will likely be on the hook for anticipated expenses. Because low-income Hoosiers are the least capable of affording rate increases, it will disproportionately affect those residents. That's why it's a concern of ours, too. Number three, as Councilmember Ruff said, it's likely just a matter of time before we are affected ourselves, most likely directly by having our own water uh, tapped, Lake Monroe. This project sets a precedent for that. And it would also be wonderful for us to have the support from the 20 or so, or so municipalities that, like us, have offered uh, resolutions against this pipeline. Rollo encouraged his fellow council members to pass the resolution to oppose the pipeline, saying that the LEAP pipeline would be energy intensive and unsustainable. Earth Day is coming up. We're concerned about climate change. Much is made of that. Water pumping accounts for between 10 to 25 percent of global energy use. It's hugely energy intensive. That's because water's heavy. It's over eight pounds per gallon. So do the math. If this is arithmetic, if it's 100 million gallons per day, that's 800 million pounds of water to transport 52 miles from Tippecanoe County to Lebanon. Now, for municipalities like ours, water accounts for 30 to 60 percent of energy use. Bloomington peak demand is about 24 million gallons per day, so about a quarter of the 100 million that this pipeline could carry. 
So if LEAP uses 100 million gallons per day, that's four times the total use for 145,000 people that Lake Monroe currently serves. Uh, four times 145, it's almost 600,000 people. Furthermore, water from Lake Monroe is pumped 10 to, to 11 miles compared to the LEAP pipeline of 52 miles. That's four times the amount of water for five times the distance. And it's also twice the elevation that the water has to go. So simple math says that this LEAP pipeline could easily account for a carbon footprint seven times our municipal city carbon footprint. Seven times. So if you want to vote for the climate, if you want to vote uh, for sustainability, here's your chance. This resolution does that. The resolution in opposition of the LEAP pipeline passed with a vote of 7 to 0 to 1. The next Bloomington City Council meeting will be held on May 1st. At the Monroe County Commissioner's meeting on April 17th, Sheriff Department Jail Transition Director Corey Grass gave an update on the jail transition team and shared highlights from the facilities they toured. The first place we visit was down in Du Bois County. It's a much smaller facility that we're going to build here most likely. Uh, but it was a good way for us to learn about the process. Uh, some of the, the hardships they learned along the way that they would go back and change. Um, again, smaller than ours, about 70 inmates now with 140 beds, but they also talked about the fact that after they were done building, they realized they should have built some infrastructure for future growth, they'll have to go back and start all over again down the road. So just little life lessons like that. Um, the sheriff was very accommodating. They're gonna reuse the current sheriff's department for emergency management and the sheriff's department when the jail had not moved out. So again, that was kind of the way we kicked off a, a very small facility. Commissioner Julie Thomas followed up after his presentation on the jail facility tours and asked Grass to explain what else he has been doing. We um, have uh, notebooks of notes as well from our visits to various facilities and a lot of this is um, brings back some of those same concepts that we talked about earlier. Um, I'm glad that all of this is going on and it's good to uh, bring uh, the public into it. And I think it's important to note that um, the process, even though we are um, working through the process of finalizing a site, there are other things that can be done beyond the tours even. And so um, can you talk a little bit about that for the public, about what, what your role is working with DLZ beyond the tours, what's going on with that? The public. I should have mentioned this too, but the interviews we did yesterday were open to the public. It was announced they, they could have come and sat in and listened. It was also recorded for future viewing if, if the public wants to see topics discussed, questions asked, or proposals that were made. So super transparent in everything we're doing. Um, you mentioned the things that we're doing right now before the site is picked. Uh, again, Scott Carnegie has done this so many times from DLZ. He makes it easier than I could ever imagine to try and get it done. Uh, and Richard Kreider from the county, we've been doing meetings on um, potential programming coming up, because if we are gonna include the justice complex, not just the jail, there are things we can start working on now as far as spacing, uh, number of space we might need, how it'll be laid out, things we're not aware of even right now that, we're, that could be added on. Um, early when I first started, I, I did a lot of outreach with the Chamber of Commerce, NAACP, I'm gonna forget a bunch of people, because I, I spoke to the probation, uh, pub, public defender's office, the prosecutor, uh, anybody who would have had a stake, I thought, in a justice building just to ask, what have we done well for the last 40 years in this jail, but what can we do better in the next jail? So all that input I've been trying to keep for ideas. I don't, we can't accomplish all of that, but we can at least get as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the programming, the ideas, the note taking going on behind the scenes. Later in the meeting, the commissioners heard a request from Highway Department Director Lisa Ridge to award the 2024 Community Crossing Grant Paving Projects to milestone contractors. Ridge also shared which roads will be renovated. So we uh, opened bids uh, publicly on March 27th. There were two bids received, ENB paving and Milestone. Milestone was the lowest, most responsive and responsible bidder. The paving projects are the roads that we had submitted in the 2024 Community Crossing Grant Program. That was awarded on April 10th, 2024. Um, I'll be bringing that contract I just received yesterday, uh, next Wednesday for the commissioners to approve. Um, the Monroe County was awarded the max amount of 1.5 million. Um, and the match for this comes out of the rainy day fund that the council has appropriated. Um, 
the roads that are listed in the project area um, that will be completed in 2024 uh, is Mount Pleasant Road, Monroe Dam Road, Valley Mission Road, Sewell Road, Brockport Road, Bremens Creek Road, Bram Creek Road, Popcorn Road, Vernal Pike, Chambers Pike, Zykes Road, Woodland Road, Oak Ridge Road, and then Shelburne Woods Subdivision, which would also include Andover Court, Brewster Court, Bristol Drive, Chatham Drive, Foxway Drive, Liverpool Lane, Manchester Court, Shelburne Drive, Trenton Overlook, Winterberry Court, and Yorkshire Court. Um, I want to thank our crews that's worked really hard to get all of these roads ready. Uh, we put this out to bid early so, um, in anticipation of this award. Uh, we, once we receive it, we can move forward. Um, our crews have been working diligently to get the roads ready through ditching, pipe replacements, um, tree removal, brush cutting. Um, so we're ready to go. It's being awarded, so we're kind of ahead of the game. And we couldn't have done that with all of our crews and staff at the highway garage. Commissioner Julie Thomas thanked Ridge and the Highway Department for their work and commented that the west side of the county will be busy with road work this summer. The 2024 Community Crossing Grant project bid awarded to Milestone contractors was approved unanimously. The next Monroe County Commissioner's meeting will be held on April 24th. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. <music> Welcome back to Cats Week. The Monroe County Election Board held a special session on April 15th to discuss the election workers' compensation. County Attorney Molly Turner King introduced the discussion and provided some background information. The first item for consideration by the Election Board today is the proposed amendments to Chapter 287, which of the Monroe County Code, and I'm going to display that code for you. Um, this is a code section that was adopted in 2014. And I will attempt to make it uh, legible. Um, this chapter establishes limitations on the per diem's additional compensation and meal allowances for election workers. On April 10th of this year, I presented to the commissioners suggested amendments to this code section pertaining to the addition of absentee couriers and counters. Um, because the code section, now I've made it too big, sorry. Um, the code section didn't um, provide for their a per diem for those two positions. Um, these are two types of election workers in Monroe County, as I said, that didn't have a per diem, uh, but the commissioners are statutorily responsible for setting that per diem. During the April 10th meeting, the election supervisor also expressed that it would be the desire of the clerk's office um, for the other election workers, and I'm going to scroll down in the code section, uh, specifically the inspectors, the judges and clerks and sheriffs um, to receive an increase in compensation. At the meeting, uh, at the commissioner's meeting, the justification that was offered was that multiple individuals who serve as election or as poll workers 
um, had contacted the clerk's office and expressed that without a raise, they would not be willing to work on the election day. And this was based, um, I think, on the fact that the absentee uh, workers did receive a raise. Um, so the commissioners are looking for an election board recommendation on how chapter 287 should be amended. To aid the election board in this decision, I provided several documents for you um, on the bench. The first two pages are highlighted and they are labeled primary 2023 and general 2023. These are the, um, it's the first page of the pay vouchers for the primary and general election. Luckily on the first page, there was an inspector, a clerk and a judge. And so I just highlighted them to show you the pay um, that was received in May and November of last year. Um, I don't, I didn't provide you all 46 pages, but if you'd like them, I do have them available. Laura Wirt, who attended the meeting serving as proxy for clerk Nicole Brown, shared points that Brown provided to her. The clerk had given me some things, uh, some points that she would like me to express. Okay. Uh, she had mentioned that uh, she'd like to convey in no certain terms that her advocacy for her increase in election day pay is as passionate as the advocacy she had in working to get the pay raise for absentee early voting workers. The ability to recruit and retain quality workers is not just a Monroe County problem, it is a problem throughout the Hoosier State and across the nation. What we're finding out is more and more people are like, I'd rather stay at home, I'd rather have the day off than to actually come out and assist with the elections and it becomes a struggle. So it becomes more of an incentive for people to realize that it's, it's a little better for them to, yes, we are helping with the elections, but yes, we also have some things that we can have covered with the money that they get. Um, with the cost of living, everybody, everybody knows about the cost of living lately. The last couple of years has gone up and this also helps with things that the election workers will be able to take care of on their own because of those raises of cost of living. So uh, she had, she reached out to Hamilton County because the cost of living in Monroe County <coughs> is very similar, if not more than Hamilton County cost of living. And she wanted to bring that to attention. So I also had made up an election day workers co uh, comparison worksheet. So we have Monroe County per diem, the Monroe County, so the requested versus the current. We also, I added in Brown County because it is a much smaller county, but it tends to have a little higher uh, compensation. Uh, Hamilton County per diem, Monroe meals, Brown meals, Hamilton, et cetera, training, uh, requested versus current. Uh, if you would look at these comparisons. I think the one thing that stands out the most is that the inspectors in Hamilton County are paid a higher price, uh, a higher for the amount of precincts that they take on. So for example, if up to six precincts it, for one inspector, they get 600. So that is something that I do believe Clerk Brown had made very abundantly clear that she would like to have a similar compensation for that because, you know, for example, Brown County just has one precinct per inspector and that's all they have, that's includes all the paperwork, all the stress, all the uh, additional people that come around uh, with different questions because every precinct has a different question. So um, she would really like to focus definitely on the inspectors and everybody else to a certain degree Board member John Fernandez summarized their recommendation to the Monroe County Commissioners. To summarize what we're recommending then it, to the commissioners is that for inspectors, uh, the compensation would not exceed 200. That compares to today of 165. Uh, for judges, not to exceed 175, which compares to 135 uh, today. And then for clerks, we're recommending 150, uh, which compares to 135 uh, today. And then we're also adding um, a training line uh, for sheriffs, because we currently do not include them at all, uh, with the training um, amount not to exceed uh, $30. And then we're also adding the absentee counter at 175, 
and the absentee courier at 150. The board voted unanimously to pass this recommendation on to the commissioners for election day poll workers' compensation. The next meeting will be held on May 2nd. And that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman. Oh,